Good morning, everybody, and a warm welcome to this webinar uh, organized by the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. My name is Juha Jokela, and I work at the Institute as the director of our EU research program. And it's my great pleasure to moderate this first session of this uh, event we have put together for today. And this webinar marks two events or developments. Uh, the first one is, of course, the most important, and that's uh, Austria's, Finland's and Sweden's 25 years of EU membership. And the second one, somewhat more minor event, relates to the launch of a FIA Finnish foreign policy paper, which will look at the change and continuity uh, in Finnish uh, foreign and security policy during the EU membership. Our paper has actually been ready for quite some time now. Uh, its publication seminar in the late March 2020 was actually the first event that we had to cancel because of the outbreak of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, while the paper focuses on the past 25 years, we however hope that it will lead to a discussion of the future as well. And that is why this webinar has two sessions. Uh, the one, the first one, which focuses on the past 25 years, and then the second one, where we focus on the next uh, 25 years of EU membership of Austria, Finland and Sweden. Uh, the research project behind this uh, webinar and the new uh, FIA publication has been supported by the uh, Ministry for, for Foreign Affairs of Finland and therefore I'm delighted to introduce you to our, to our first speaker who is a permanent state secretary uh, of, of the Finnish uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Matti Antonen. To best of my knowledge, he has followed very closely uh, this research project we have carried out in FIA and actually the ID to mark the 25th anniversary by conducting, conducting research came from him. Uh, Antonen has a very extensive career in the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he has served as the Under Secretary of State for Economic uh, uh, Affairs in the Ministry as well as ambassadors to Stockholm and Moscow. Uh, and I think that when Finland joined the European Union in 1995, Mr. Antonen was working in the Department uh, for Russia and Eastern Europe. Mr. Antonen, the floor is now yours. Uh, please uh, give the opening remarks for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, most welcome from my side uh, to this event focusing on Finland's 25 years as a member of the European Union. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we became member in 95, but uh, I actually started uh, attending the EU working groups already in autumn 94, even before our referendum, which then approved our uh, membership but uh, so I've been in this business for a little more than 25 years. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the colleagues from the Finnish Institute of International Affairs and from my own ministry to making this event possible and a special thanks to the authors authors of the report and all to the all the speakers who are contributing with their thoughts and ideas today. Uh, membership of the European Union was the most important turning point in the history of our Republic, which will be soon celebrating its 103rd birthday. Uh, as a nation, Finland is of course much older. We have been part of the Western European civilization for centuries, uh, and this deeply rooted democratic political system, strong emphasis on equality, free market economy and a law-based society witness of this. When it comes to these fundamental values, 1995 didn't change much in Finland and we felt at home from the very beginning. Membership of the Union uh, was a culmination of our policy of economic integration. 
Western Europe was and still is the most important economic and trading partner for us. Even after the Brexit, uh, over 50% of goods leaving Finland will find their way to the other member states of the Union. The aim of this integration policy was to ensure that our companies and especially our forest industry, which at that stage uh, dominated our exports, would have the same market access as its main competitors, especially in countries like Sweden and Norway. And this is the background why we negotiated an association agreement with the European Free Trade Association in the early 60s and then later on in early 70s negotiated a free trade agreement with the European Economic Community. Uh, and then uh, in early 90s we concluded the EEA agreement which further improved the market access and at the same time bound us more closely to the rules of the European Union's internal market. For Finland, the European Union membership was much more than just an economic question. This was very much emphasized by our former president Koivisto, uh, and I think that's quite clear for all Finns. Because for the first time, in history, we had a seat at the table where our continent's future was discussed and important decisions were made of our common future. Finland supports the efforts to make even the Union an even stronger player in global politics. In order to achieve this, we would like to see more use of qualitative majority voting in the common foreign and security policy as well. We also see the merits uh, of the uh, uh, common uh, defense and uh, security policy uh, of the European Union. Finland participated in several PESCO projects and the newly created uh, DG for uh, defense industry and space is led by our, our compatriot Timo Pesonen. Since our accession, the number of member states has grown from 15 to 27. Finland has strong, strongly supported this enlargement process. We have seen how integration of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania has made them an important economic and political partner for us. These southern neighbours are as important an export market for Finland as our eastern neighbour, Russia, which is 15 times larger economy than these three countries together. It is difficult to imagine, imagine a, more, a more convincing argument for the merits of the four freedoms and the single market. Uh, our accession made the Union also a neighbour of Russia. Even though the Union and Russia had signed the partnership and cooperation already, uh, agreement already at the same Corfu summit, where our, the accession agreements of Finland, Austria and Sweden was signed, the cooperation was rather limited and didn't provide the answers to the challenges facing the European North, where the Union and its Western partners, Norway and Iceland, and its Eastern neighbour, Russia, meets. Uh, this led to the establishment of the Northern Dimension concept, which has been instrumental in solving, for example, environmental challenges in the Northwest Russia. Uh, the first 20 years of our membership saw a broadening and deepening of EU-Russia relationship, uh, but the Russian illegal annexation of Ukrainian territory and the still ongoing war conflict in Eastern Europe has brought much of this to a standstill. The internal market makes us, the IE, the Union, an interesting partner for other nations. Agreements with Japan, Canada, South Korea and so on show the attractiveness of Union as a partner. This policy of free rules-based trade has enjoyed strong support in Finland and it is seen here as a continuation of our policy of economic integration starting from the 1950s. During the last quarter of a century, the relative share of the Union in the world's population and economy has declined. This trend will continue and we cannot change that. But at the same time, the role of the Union as a supporter of free trade 
or as a front runner in climate policy has moved to another direction. Our, incre our importance has increased. For countries like Finland, it is clear that we can best influence global developments by pooling our forces with other member states. This will require better working methods and that we stick to those European values which are the foundation of this most successful peace project in the world's history. I wish you a most interesting and useful seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Permanent Secretary Antonin, for your opening remarks and, and laying out the, uh, uh, the ground for this, uh, this webinar, where we will now uh, look at the uh, 25 years of Finland's uh, uh, a membership in the EU and in particular from the foreign and security policy angle. Uh, I think that the security, as you mentioned as well, has been one of the key drivers of, of Finland's uh, integration into the European Union and today it's a very uh, relevant as well. I think also that the security has been understood broadly in Finland and, and the focus on uh, uh, great power relations as well as the geoeconomic turn uh, very well uh, uh, relates to that uh, Finnish aspiration to work together in the EU to manage uh, the developments in world politics and economy. Now we will move uh, to to the uh, session of uh, of this uh, of this session where we focus on the on the paper that we have published today, and that paper will be uh, presented to you by two uh, uh, authors of the paper. First, Matti Pesu, who works as a senior research fellow at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. I think Matti is very uh, well known to you all as an expert of, of uh, Baltic Sea region security, European security architecture, as well as the Finnish uh, uh, Swedish uh, security and defense uh, policy cooperation. Uh, Matti will be joined by our research fellow Tuomas Isomarku, uh, who is also uh, well known for you, I, I suspect, uh, as, as one of the uh, experts in the Institute focusing very closely on the EU's uh, security and defense policy, uh, among, other th um, among other things, as well as uh, uh, Germany's role in the, in the European Union. After the introduction of the paper, we will have two uh, excellent comment, uh, 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 commentators for, th for the paper. The first one is uh, Gunilla Herov, uh, who is a senior associate fellow at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs in Stockholm. And Gunilla has been following uh, 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 EU from several angles, as well as the uh, Nordic uh, states' uh, policies towards the EU, of course, especially Sweden, and the security and defense policy is something what Kunila ha has worked extensively, and uh, and she's been she's been very busy the previous uh, weeks and days, and also the the coming days on several webinars. Uh, uh, organized uh, uh, in relation to the Finnish and Swedish uh, EU policies uh, here in, in Finland. And our second commentator is Ambassador Max Millan Henning from Austria. He has served uh, uh, as an ambassador to Helsinki from the 2018. And I had a great pleasure to, to, to exchange ideas with him already uh, earlier this year in the Turku Europe Forum. And I'm, I'm very delighted that you could join us here today and, and provide us as a viewpoint from Ast Austria to this paper and the theme of the, of the webinar. But now I will pass the floor to our uh, research fellows. And I would also like to uh, announce that the comment uh, chat box in the web page where you are following this uh, uh, webinar is open and I will pick up comments and questions uh, from that chat box, chat box in due course. But now our researchers, Matti and Thomas, the floor is yours. Okay, um, good morning everyone. Um, so during the next 15 minutes or so, uh, 
we will walk you through the main points and arguments of our FIA Finnish foreign policy paper, which, as was said by you already, is published today in con conjunction with this webinar. In the paper, we look at the interaction or interrelationship between Finnish foreign security policy and the EU's foreign security policy during Finland's 25 years as an EU member state. Essentially, we are interested in two things. First, the kind of implications that participation in the EU's foreign security policy has meant for Finland and for Finnish foreign policy. And secondly, the way Finland itself has approached the EU's foreign, policy, uh, foreign security policy during its membership. Now, it is, of course, clear to us that foreign security policy are only one part of Finland's very comprehensive engagement with and within the European Union. At the same time, uh, we argue that uh, the area of foreign security policy is actually a very uh, a crucial dimension of Finland's EU membership. This was already echoed uh, by uh, Matti Antonen in his opening remarks and uh, Juha as well. Now there are at least four reasons why we think that foreign security policy are uh, such a crucial part of what uh, Finnish EU membership is about. First, uh, already the decision to seek membership was uh, to a large extent a foreign policy decision. It was a conscious reaction to substantial changes in international politics. Secondly, uh, both the accession to and the membership in the EU have had a strong impact on Finnish foreign security policy, requiring it to reassess the very foundations of its foreign policy orientation. Uh, thirdly, the depth and scope of EU foreign policy have uh, expanded significantly during Finland's 25 years uh, as EU member. And fourthly, uh, the EU has from the very start been, and as we argue in this paper, remains by far Finland's most important framework for international engagement. Now there is already a rich body of literature on the relationship between Finnish foreign policy uh, of Finnish foreign security policy and EU foreign security policy on which we build in our paper. Um, from this literature, we know that EU membership has had uh, a significant impact on Finnish foreign security policy. This is visible in at least three ways. So um, first, Finland's general foreign policy orientation and outlook have changed uh, al already. Uh, ba basically, this change started be before the accession, uh, but uh, the accession accelerated uh, uh, and deepened this change. Uh, this basically relates to uh, how Finland has transformed from a strictly neutral uh, state into uh, an active EU member state. And secondly, this also refers to how Finland's foreign policy horizon has broadened uh, uh, over the course of the membership. And we will come back to this topic uh, later in our presentation. Uh, secondly, the participation in, in the EU's foreign security policy has had an impact on Finland's foreign policy structures and processes. Uh, just to mention one or highlight one particularly relevant case here. Uh, this relates to the changing division of competencies and changing division of labor between uh, our government and our president. And thirdly, uh, Finnish EU membership has molded Finland's approach towards individual foreign policy fields and topics. Uh, and the EU security and defense dimension, as well as Finland's Rus Russia policy, are uh, just two examples to be mentioned here, and that we also looked at more in detail in our paper. Uh, overall, um, we have approached 
the interrelationship between Finnish and EU foreign security policy by looking at some of these above mentioned points more in detail. Uh, rather than breaking totally new ground, what we aim to do with our paper is to provide a contemporary interpretation of uh, some of these topics mentioned here. And now to you, Matti. Thank you, Thomas, and good morning, all. So um, I'll first elaborate uh, how Finland has practiced its Russia policy in, in the framework of its EU membership. And the, our, our key argument is that um, throughout its membership in the EU, Finland has traced two different uh, agendas regarding its big neighbor. First, from the outset, uh, Hels uh, Helsinki has seen EU membership as a, as a national security choice, as both um, Matti Antonen and Thomas Ismarku have already highlighted. In other words, Finland has perceived uh, the EU as a security community, offering protection against potential security threats, including a possible menace from Russia. The second, more optimistic agenda is related to the EU's role as a supporter of the positive transformation of Russia's domestic policies and more broadly its role in the Euro-Atlantic community. Uh, the existence of these both agendas was recognized already before Finnish uh, membership by Finnish policymakers and importantly the overall state of the EU-Russia rela relationship uh, determines the context in which Finland manages its relationship with Russia and in particular, uh, the prospects of the transformative agenda have all, always hinged on the state of broader EU-Russia relations. Although the uh, optimism regarding Russia's development faded throughout the 1990s and 2000s, the, uh, the transformative agenda uh, was prevailing until early 19, uh, uh, until uh, early mid-2010s, uh, uh, particularly in the 1990s, Finnish policymakers called for Russia's integration into European political structures. The Northern Dimension Initiative also reflected uh, the transformative goals uh, during its uh, EU presidencies in 1999 and 2006. Finland did its best to maintain the EU-Russia EU relationship and, and partnership. But the conditions for pursuing the transformative agenda were diminishing throughout the 2000s, and it wasn't until 2014 it effectively collapsed. The protective agenda, as we call it, started to dominate. First and foremost, Finland has consistently supported the EU's restrictive measures against Russia. Moreover, there are also a number of indirect signs indicating that Finland has adopted a more protective approach to Russia. Finland has stepped up its activity regarding EU defense cooperation, as I, so, as I soon will point out. And it has also highlighted the need for mutual solidarity in security questions and called for stronger measures against hybrid threats. In addition to emphasizing the importance of these two agendas, we also concluded that it has recently become uh, increasingly evident how the Finnish bilateral relationship with Russia is relational to and as well as conditioned by the EU's common Russia approach or policy in the post-2014 environment. And this is a very important uh, change given the history of strict bilateral engagement between Helsinki and Moscow. Uh, moving now on to the, the, uh, the CSDP and the a broader defense agenda. The field of security and defense has constituted uh, one of the most important areas of activity for Finland within and, and most recently beyond the broader CFSP framework. From the early years of Finnish EU membership until today, Finland has endeavored to shape the EU's security and defense efforts and importantly the developments in the EU's security and defense agenda have uh, forced Finland to adapt its own security and defense policy quite considerably uh, during its membership. Um, however, 
irrespective of these changes, Finland's overall goal has remained uh, the same, uh, namely to strengthen the EU's contribution to and capacity to act in foreign security and defense policy matters. We argue that Finland's uh, initial approach towards the nascent CSDP in the late in the mid late 1990s and early 2000s was a curious mixture of proactivity on the one hand and hesitation on the on the other. Uh, briefly put, uh, Finnish policymakers maintained that developing the EU security and defense agenda was in Finnish interest as long as it did not touch upon mutual defense. And, and thus Finland and Sweden uh, were both pushing uh, EU agenda towards uh, crisis management. Hanna Ojanen has previously argued that Finland had two problems regarding the CSSD, CSDP in general and the constitutional treaty under negotiation in particular. And, and these were the possible emergence of core groups, so-called core groups, and then too much defense. Interestingly, the last half of uh, 2010s again witnessed increased Finnish advocacy for the EU security and defense agenda. This time the country has fewer, if any, reservations about how to, how, how to develop EU defense cooperation. And Finland is no longer concerned about there being too much defense. And in fact, it is one of the few countries keen to see the EU playing a more active role in, de in defending Europe. And there are multiple examples of Finnish proactivity. Uh, the most notable characteristic is, is perhaps the so-called security community discourse, highlighting the EU's role as a security provider, security community underpinned by mutual solidarity. An uh, integral part of, of this uh, security community concept is is what we call the 42.7 activism, uh, calling for the clarification and consolidation of, of mutual assistance clause of the Lisbon Treaty. Interestingly, the more enthusiastic advocacy for EU defense has moved Finland pretty close to France in terms of, of the weight that Helsinki is putting on, on, on this particular policy area. And then and furthermore, Finland has recently also built up a profile as sort of a hybrid savvy country. And that is that is also new. The last observation in, in terms of, of the CSDP is that, that despite the recent progress in made in the in EU defense cooperation and, and also despite the increased Finnish advocacy, there has been a paradoxical development worth noting and owing to Finland's rapidly evolving defense cooperation with different partners, the EU's role in the tapestry of, of co defense cooperation formats has lost some of its relative importance. And, and for Finland, um, the EU is like a solidarity framework supporting Finland's relationships with focal European players and is also a capability development platform potentially strengthening Finnish defense capabilities in the long term. But now back to Thomas and the um, broader external affairs agenda. In the last part of our paper, we descri describe uh, the role of EU membership in how Finland first discovered and then uh, established a broader international or you could also say global agenda. Uh, now some of these developments were perhaps not triggered uh, by the EU membership itself, uh, but the EU membership was definitely a crucial component in these. Uh, these relate to things as uh, Finland adopting uh, the post-Cold War uh, comprehensive security thinking, uh, which has also driven uh, the EU's external uh, action very much. Uh, the EU very quickly uh, developed into Finland's main channel for influencing regional global developments. 
and at the same time also uh, into uh, Finland's central framework uh, for human rights and development policy. EU membership also served as a reference point in discussions on international norms and rules, uh, the Ottawa Convention being just one example here. Um, what is also uh, noteworthy is that Finland has uh, underlined its commitment to the EU's common positions, which in some cases has led uh, Finland uh, to reposition itself from uh, the kind of strict neutrality positions it held during the Cold War era on some of, uh, of, of the crucial international questions. And um, of course, uh, this thematical widening has also gone hand in hand with uh, geographical widening of Finnish foreign policy as uh, countries and areas that have been higher uh, on the agendas of other member states have uh, moved up on the Finnish foreign and security policy agenda as well. Um, this, the development of this international or global agenda has not been a straightforward thing. Uh, Finland has also had its frustrations, uh, struggles. So even though uh, the EU uh, has always been the most important framework uh, for driving this international and global agenda, uh, especially in the late 2000s, there were also attempts uh, to uh, address these issues through other frameworks, most notably different Nordic foreign security policy structures, as well as uh, the UN. Most recently, uh, we have again seen uh, the EU's role become uh, more central, uh, especially uh, due to the intensifying great power competition and the related uh, geoeconomic threats that you have already mentioned. Overall, uh, through the three areas that we looked at in our paper, we uh, conclude that interaction between Finnish and EU foreign policy has varied over time and uh, across different subfields. So what we see here are differing patterns of change and continuity over the membership period. Uh, one can say that Finland has invested very strongly in EU foreign policy, which has also led to high expectations. And this has also uh, been the cause for occasional frustration for Finland and uh, the search for alternative avenues I mentioned before. But Finland has remained continuously committed to uh, furthering uh, the EU's foreign and security policy and other uh, formats and frameworks have been seen at best as complementary. And the final comment uh, is that Finland has always understood EU membership as a security policy choice, as we already heard in the opening remarks. However, uh, we argue that during recent years, the EU role in enhancing Finnish security has actually become a top priority. So that's why uh, we argue uh, or conclude in our paper that Finland is now endeavoring to unlock the EU's full security potential. Thank you very much to Thomas and Matti for this very comprehensive uh, presentation in very short time. Uh, the paper covers uh, a lot of ground and it has been characterized by some of the reviewers as, as very rich. So I think this is this is a good this is a good presentation to give also a glimpse of what we look at and analyze in the paper. But now I would uh, uh, now I would give the floor to Gunilla Herov uh, as a comment, commentator from Sweden. Of course, Gunilla will speak in in her own capacity, capacity as a researcher. But it would be very interesting to hear your comments from a Swedish viewpoint towards the paper on the change and continuity in Finnish uh, foreign and security policy. Gunilla, the floor is now yours. 
Thank you very much, uh, Juha. Thank you for the invitation to FIA and congratulations to Matti, Thomas and Juha for an excellent report. Uh, it has been a pleasure to read it and uh, I look forward to hear if you have later any comments to my comments. Uh, security is important for Finland and for Sweden. It was the first, the primary reason for Finland joining the EU. It was uh, not the same for Sweden. For Sweden, economy was first, but security was definitely very important as well. In your report, you have divided uh, the period that we are speaking about into three sub-periods. And uh, the first period is 1995 to 2002. And here you define it as attempts to move to the core. Uh, I think this is true for both countries, but uh, I would protest just a little bit because I don't think that Sweden and Finland only followed others. The two foreign ministers, Tarja Hallonen and Lena Jelmvalen, who were in close contact with each other, also voiced their own views, like uh, on one occasion when they uh, showed their Atlanticist views, not wanting to duplicate assets in Europe that were already available through NATO. Uh, but uh, best known, of course, is the initiative proposing to move the WU tasks of crisis management to the European Union. Uh, in this report, it is described as made in order to make a distinction between collective defense and crisis management tasks. And this was true for Sweden as, as well. One point that uh, uh, I hear a lot in Sweden also is that this gave an advantage to Finland and Sweden because this meant that already at an early stage, we were able to participate in discussions on potential EU crisis management tasks, which we appreciated a lot. A um, funny thing here is that many other countries thought about this as a concession from our side, because they had an impression that we, as non-aligned countries, were rather scared of the military side, and it was brave of us now to take it on. We did not share this view of the concession, so we, we enjoyed having to meet this argument. Um, the next period, 2003 to 2009, is called... ...for Sweden, because we were very similar during this period as well. We had our interest in uh, civil crisis management. We were eager to participate in the new crisis management tasks of the EU that came about at this time. On the whole, I think for both countries, this was a very positive period. For Sweden, it also meant uh, participating in the Artemis peace enforcement task in Congo, which was, of course, intentional, showing that we were not uh, afraid of doing also the most difficult tasks. Uh, Sweden participated and still participates in all EU missions, and it took its leadership in the three Nordic uh, battle groups very seriously, more seriously than many other bigger countries. And most important, of course, for Sweden during this period was the initiative of the Eastern Partnership in 2009, together with Poland. The third period is called here increasing uncertainty and national security a priority. This is, of course, the effect of uh, external events and uh, it hit Sweden as well as it hit uh, Finland. But we reacted in quite different ways. For Finland, it was very much about seeing the EU as uh, Thomas and Matti have already described as uh, having a role in territorial defense. Uh, even though, as you say, it has not the same status in this respect any longer. Sweden, uh, Finland also sees the 42.7 article as valid for Finland, uh, which Sweden did not. Sweden. Uh, saw the sentence that uh, 
uh, was added to the 42.7 as not meaning that it did not have to include the non-aligned countries. But for Finland, it meant an intensive cooperation with France, as you have already mentioned, for clarification and for cooperation. And also it meant that in 2016, Finland was at the forefront in the global secure in the global strategy compared to fin compared to Sweden. Uh, in the report, you also say that <clears throat> Finland has no reservations as concerns collective defense, or somewhat to that uh, about uh, the same meaning. Uh, this could not be said about Sweden, definitely not. Collective defense is seen as a big step in Sweden. Uh, Finland has also been ahead of Sweden in the sense that in already in 2017, Sweden, uh, Finland took on a new law to facilitate providing and receiving military assistance with other countries. This is a law that Sweden took only a month ago and then only concerning Finland. So this is a big difference between the two of us, I would say. About our neighborhood, you have been speaking about Russia here, and of course, having Russia as a neighbor unavoidably has a big impact. For this reason, as you have uh, described, uh, Finland has sought multilateral relations within the EU as defining its relations to Russia. Also, to promote the then ongoing transformation and then later to find protection. Uh, Sweden, in its more sheltered position, did not see the need for multilateralism vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And also on occasions, like after the Georgia war, uh, Sweden has uh, made quite strong statements against Russian policy. And this is, as we interpret it in Sweden, something that a country that is more sheltered has the possibility to do. But also as you come into uh, the last few years have involved great changes, great changes for all of us in Europe. The weakening of the multilateral cooperation, the increasing uncertainties have changed our views on the European Union. Today we turn more to the major European countries than we did before and not for territorial defense, but for cooperation in order to increase our military capabilities. Uh, somewhere in the report, you also say that the most important relations for you now in terms of defense are relations to Sweden, to the United States and to NATO. And the equivalent is equally true to Sweden. We follow each other totally in this sense. And also the other Nordic countries are very similar in this respect as turning to the major European countries. Uh, then I will finally say something about the Nordic cooperation, which has also increased as an effect of what the latest few years have meant for us. We have come closer to each other when we see that multilateral organizations have become weaker. We are close to each other and we are, we are close to each other in all respects, not least geographically, of course. There are now other kinds of cooperation than we had before when the institutional differences were so important. And the trilateral agreement in September between Sweden, Finland and Norway aiming at coordination of future military operations is something that was hardly conceivable some five years ago. And that's where I end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gunilla, for these very analytical and to the point insights. And I think this really shows what, what the kind of the comparative uh, element adds to our analysis as well when we discuss 
uh, foreign and security policy. Sweden, of course, has been followed very closely here in Finland, and, and also FIA has been following that. So that's also why I'm really interested in, in hearing more from the Austrian perspective, uh, the country that joined the same time together with Finland. So the floor is now yours, Ambassador Maximilian Henning. Thank you very much, Juha. Uh, thank you to FIA for this really good initiative. Uh, and thanks, of course, to the authors of the paper that we're discussing today. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, EU accession was a real game changer for Austria as well. Uh, like Finland, we had spent half a century on the edge of the Iron Curtain. Uh, and suddenly we had the opportunity to move to the center of a new and united Europe. During the Cold War years, both Finland and Austria were on the lucky side of the Iron Curtain, but only just. Uh, we were in, on the periphery of the West, if you want. Economically, both our countries were struggling with marginal locations and still a long way away from the thriving economies that we know today. And all through that period, the threat of global military confrontation between East and West were always present. Now, during those years, we had used the policies of active neutrality within the United Nations framework and in other international fora uh, to play our own little roles in the whole uh, international uh, inter interaction of states. But political uh, room for maneuver was limited. Uh, now, with the fall of the Iron Curtain, the entire foreign policy outlook for our own country changed completely. And given a new opportunity to, to kickstart a, a new process of European unification, we took this opportunity very eagerly. In 1994, a referendum was held on EU accession in Austria, and uh, two-thirds, 66% uh, of Austrians voted in favor of uh, joining the EU. Uh, the paper that Matti and Tuomas uh, introduced earlier uh, stated quite clearly that for Finland, uh, joining the EU was a foreign policy decision or a, a security policy decision, if you want. For Austria, I think it very clearly wasn't. A uh, little bit similar to what uh, Gunilla Herolf had uh, said earlier, I think it was much more about the economy, it was about trade, but it was also about new opportunities to work abroad, to study abroad, to move and to travel within the United Europe and to help us uh, shape a new uh, European uh, policy, whether we speak about uh, the European common market or a, a broader European political actor. Uh, well, for us, certainly joining the EU has paid off. Our economy has blossomed. Our export tripled over the quarter century that we had joined the EU, and 70% of our exports go to EU countries. Uh, Estimates say that uh, EU, uh, that uh, economic growth is at least 16% higher uh, and employment 13% higher only due to our uh, EU accession. But more important than our own accession in 95 were the ensuing rounds uh, of enlargement in 2004, 2007 and 2013 when our neighbors in Central and Eastern Europe joined. Today, Vienna has become a financial and commercial hub for the whole of Central Europe. Uh, and don't forget, we export more goods to Hungary than to Russia. Uh, we export more to Slovenia than to China, uh, more to Slovakia than the whole of Latin America. So our neighborhood uh, is not only socially and culturally tied to us, but also fundamentally economically tied to us. And to return again to the security dimension that uh, the paper talks about, uh, today, of course, we are surrounded, with the exception of Switzerland and Liechtenstein, we are surrounded by NATO and EU members. Uh, like Finland, we joined the EU as a neutral or non-aligned country, and today we still are, uh, and there is so far very little interest in Austria to join any military alliances. But this does not prevent us from participating actively in the development of the EU's common uh, security policy and participating in EU missions, whether it's political missions, uh, civilian missions or military. 
Uh, like Finland, we are quite strongly invested in the EU's foreign and security policy. Uh, and despite occasional frustrations, as have already been mentioned, uh, we will continue to do so actively. Uh, but for us, development of the European Union, of course, is not over yet. And uh, as an Austrian, I have to mention this. You have heard me speak about this before. Uh, the European Union is not complete without the Balkans. Uh, a little bit, uh, uh, the, the paper speaks about uploading foreign policy priorities. Uh, and like the paper says that one of uh, Finland's foreign policy priorities that have been uploaded up to the European level have been Finland's approach to Russia and to the Nord northern dimension or the Nordic dimension of Europe. For us, this has been pushing for a proactive enlargement policy, first in Central Europe uh, and now in Southeastern Europe. And it's in our very own interest. Uh, it, Europe's security depends very much on peace in the Balkans. I don't need to explain uh, what that means in this audience. Uh, we very recently had uh, uh, an anniversary of the First World War, which definitely started in Southeastern Europe. Uh, we in Austria, we have a shared history with the region, strong economic ties, strong family and social ties, cultural ties. But the whole of Europe has a commitment to the region of Southeastern Europe to help them on board the European project. And we cannot turn our backs on this region. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, the United Europe is not a goal in itself. It's for us, it's an instrument, a common structure, a community, if you want a herd, uh, that will help us uh, to face up to the challenges uh, ahead of us, uh, to the challenges facing uh, us on a global level. Uh, and this is why we will continue to work strongly together with our partners, both those uh, who were in the European Union from the beginning, those who joined together with us in 95, those who have joined in subsequent enlargement uh, rounds, and those who I hope will join us very, very soon uh, in upcoming enlargement rounds. Thank you very much, Johan. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for these very enlightening uh, remarks from, from the Austrian perspective. And as I said with Kunilla, I think it's, it's really important to have these different views, the comparative element uh, with us. As uh, time is very limited here, I would now like to take a couple of important questions which have come uh, in the chat box and then I would just pass the floor back to our speakers to have uh, their final uh, uh, comments. And of course, our uh, author speakers, uh, Tuomas and Matti, you're very free to comment also the comments provided by uh, Gunilla and uh, Mr. Henning. So the one comment which, which came into the uh, chat box concerns the qualified majority voting in the common foreign and security policy. And this was because uh, uh, State Secretary Matti Antonen suggested that, that Finland is, 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 is supporting the initiative. And the fields uh, where the, co uh, the qualified majority voting could be uh, uh, extended uh, have been stated to be uh, human rights policy, uh, sanctions policy, uh, and some discussions also uh, the Commission has uh, suggested that it could be also uh, uh, civilian uh, crisis operations. So the question is that if Finland is uh, for this uh, discussion and in an expansion, how would uh, how could we potentially or how the other member state could be uh, uh, geared towards that kind of thinking because we we know that there is not much uh, support in in several member states for this uh, initiative the, the second question touches upon the the, the euro as a, the single currency and, and 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 i think finland is maybe the only uh, euro country where the membership of the single currency have been, has been discussed also as a security policy uh, uh, choice, as a, to have security policy implications at least. So the, the question was that uh, uh, what would the uh, unraveling of the euro mean for Finland's security if that uh, would happen in the future in, in, in terms of financial crisis? And the, the third question uh, touches upon the shift from neutrality to uh, uh, 
political economic alignment yet still military non-aligned country uh, joining the EU. Uh, the question is that whether this uh, transformation of Finnish security policy, whether whether it was a difficult uh, politically for the fin Finland political landscape, uh, whether there was uh, also uh, a clear opposition to this transformation, transformation from neutrality to EU membership and alignment in political and economic fields. But now I would pass the floor back to first uh, uh, Matti and Tuomas, and then I would still like to give floor to our commentators as well. And I would uh, uh, ask you to be rather brief uh, and touch upon the themes that you find most uh, important as, as we are uh, running out of time uh, quite soon. Well, I, I can start Tuomas knows few of you and euro questions much better than i do but i'll maybe a few words about the euro the uh, finnish discourse about eu's significance to finnish security is pretty unique and, and perhaps that's why we have a proclivity to securitize different aspects of eu eu policy so it's very hard to well, it's not easy to see what are the euro euro security dimensions. Perhaps the potential un unraveling of the common currency would cause notable political turbulence in Europe, which which would somehow de destabilize the continent for a certain period of time, and that may have some implications for for Finnish security as well. That would be my uh, maybe answer or speculation. Then like neutrality question i think finnish elite has treated neutrality like pretty instrumentally so that's why the um turn from strict policy of neutrality to eu and military norm alignment was rather smooth but as we argue in the paper there have been a number of so-called uh, growing pains where particularly the internationalization of Finnish defense has caused some notable debate uh, in, in Finnish society. So mainly smooth, but there are also some some uh, resistance as as well. Yeah, just uh, a couple of small points from my side. Um, of course, I mean our paper looks at Finland's EU membership through the lens of foreign security policy. And in that context, uh, this security dimension uh, gets even more importance uh, than, than it otherwise might. But, but, but I think it's still true to characterize uh, Finnish membership as, as being uh, to, uh, to a very crucial extent about, about security, but, but of course, uh, as was actually already mentioned in the opening remarks, uh, uh, Finland's Western integration before the EU accession is also very much about uh, about uh, market access and economic relations. Um, but that said, it was very interesting to to hear these uh, Swedish and Austrian viewpoints as well, where the economic aspects uh, are highlighted uh, perhaps to a greater extent uh, than in Finland. Um, as for uh, the scenario of, uh, of an unraveling of the euro, I, I very much agree with uh, Matti that um, I guess uh, the, the crucial security implications would be simply that it would undermine the, the cohesion of the European Union the unity of the European Union, and uh, as as we see, have seen, uh, those have already been very severely tested in in recent years, and uh, those bo both of those are very important for the EU's external actorness. So, uh, in that sense, I I very much echo Matti's words here. And uh, the same goes for, for this transformation. I also think that uh, 
it has perhaps not been uh, as politically challenging as it might have, but of course there are several phases during Finnish membership uh, where um, some of the aspects of, of Finnish non-alignment uh, have been adapted uh, to the demands of EU membership and this has not always been easy. So several of uh, these kind of cases are mentioned in our paper as well. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I think we still have a, the question about the qualified majority voting in the CFSP, and I would now perhaps ask uh, uh, the Austrian ambassador uh, and perhaps also Gunilla to to reflect upon how's the how's the debate on that element of common foreign and security policy in your country. Shall I go first? Yes, please. Please. Uh, Thank you, Joha, uh, and thanks for the questions. Uh, I think to pick up on the unanimity and qualified majority question first, uh, I think we cannot discuss this uh, foreign policy issue on its own. If we do move to new policy making uh, instruments, to new ways of, of taking decisions, we need something bigger. We need a conference for the future of Europe where we discuss a wider range of issues at the same time. Only then will it be possible to get those countries on board who might have individual uh, doubts about parts of these decisions. So you will need a much broader process. And this is what uh, my government has been pushing for quite heavily, uh, that, uh, that we need to discuss this in a much broader context of uh, changing our decision-making processes as a whole. Uh, uh, yes, otherwise, I, I will try not to comment on the Armageddon scenario of an unraveling of the euro. I think uh, we will have a, ho a whole range of difficulties and problems in all areas. So I'd, I'd, I think uh, we, we would have issues on the security front, but, but on many other fronts as well. Uh, just to comment on the third question briefly on neutrality and non-alignment. Uh, because my country, Austria, has not made this transition from neutrality to non-alignment. Uh, in fact, we are quite, uh, uh, quite clearly uh, stating that our neutrality remains untouched, even though neutrality in its nature has obviously changed uh, by joining the European Union. Uh, and we are ready to adapt our uh, neutrality as the European Union itself evolves. And I stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Gunilla. Uh, yeah, uh, there have been some uh, statements expressing understanding for the need of uh, possibly a qualified majority voting, but it is also understood that uh, this is not an easy thing to do. That's all I will say about that. But I would also say a little bit about the euro. The question uh, about the importance of the euro in security terms generally, um, it is important and I think it is very important for the relations between Finland and Sweden, because if President Macron's plans for concentric circles and multi-speed Europe will come true, Finland will definitely also, in his more detailed plans, come into a more closer circle than Sweden will. And uh, I think this will be a big problem for Sweden in the future, actually. So not a small thing at all. Thank you. Thank you very much for your for your comments and your answers to the question. Questions which were very broad and the time was very limited. So I'm very happy with the with the outcome of this last round of, of your uh, input as well. Uh, now uh, it's almost five past eleven, so we have to end this first session. But you are, of course, very welcome, everybody, to come and follow the second one, where we will focus on the next 25 years. Uh, the title is uh, uh, EU and Finland in the Changing World. And there we will be hearing also a keynote uh, address by uh, uh, Jyrki Katainen, who is the managing director of CITRA, but also uh, formerly a prime minister of Finland and the Finnish 
Commissioner and Vice President of the European Commission. But now I would like to thank our excellent speakers, uh, including the Permanent Secretary Matti Antonen for your input. It's been, a it been, it's been a pleasure to moderate this session and I hope you will all read our paper and I hope that that will bring some food for thought for further discussions also within this group of, of countries. It was a pleasure for me. Thank you. This uh, webinar's first session is now over and I would ask everybody to come back uh, online quarter past 11, finish time. Thank you.
In five minutes, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mika, for introducing all those topics because uh, I I was planning in my introduction, I was planning to touch upon all of those <laughs> uh, issues myself. Great. So somehow we we are thinking a bit same way. I was following you as the prime minister, if I'm allowed to say, uh, <laughs> as a civil servant, and I was. Please, thank you. Great, welcome back to the second part of this great seminar. I would like to thank FIA also from my behalf uh, on organizing this great, great seminar. And I was following the first discussion, which was really good. And now we will get to the, the most interesting part. So the next 25 years, changing world and Europe. And I mean, it's it's really a great honor for me to moderate this debate. The world is in a very interesting place at the moment. There is the climate emergency. There's the great power competition going on. The liberal world order is shaking and uh, China is more and more assertive. And uh, there is clearly a need for the EU to do something. And there's clearly a need for countries like Finland and Austria and Sweden to do something to make the world great again. 
And also, on, I mean, on the EU stage, there's a lot of uh, talk about the conference on the future of Europe that is coming. That will be, at least from my point of view, a very great opportunity to look really closely at what should be changed in the way the EU does business and to try to refocus our work on the most important things that are ahead of us. And also the Finnish government is drafting at the moment a white paper on the EU. It should be coming out uh, in the end of the year, roughly speaking. So this also as a government official, this is a great, great place to hear from wise people some ideas on what we should be doing in the future. We have one hour uh, or 55 minutes. We will give uh, Mika Altala the opportunity for closing remarks in the end. And uh, we will start by a keynote address by Jyrki Katainen, who is the president of Citra, the Finnish Innovation Fund. And as you know, he has been serving as the uh, commission vice president and Finnish prime minister and finance minister as well. So he's pretty knowledgeable about EU affairs, I would say. And uh, then after this keynote, we will give uh, the other speakers the possibility to comment on Jyrki's keynote. We have Paul Schmidt, who is the General Secretary of the Austrian Society for European Politics, and he has a background in, uh, in the central banking affairs, if I understand correctly, which is great. And then we have Hanna Ojanen, who is adjunct professor at the Finnish National Defence University and at the University of Helsinki. And she is very, very inside the EU debate and has been following these issues for a long time. But without further ado, I will give the floor to Jürgen. Please. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank uh, very much uh, for organizing this kind of event. We need more future oriented, future looking EU debate in this country. I, I think it's the same in most of the EU countries. Sometimes I, I find it quite um, annoying that we only look at the issues on the table, but uh, very little issues which should be on the table. And this event is uh, for for uh, looking at the issues which should be on the EU's table, as well as uh, in, in Finnish government's table. So I'd like to start by just mentioning the self-clear facts that the political environment has changed a lot and the landscape is very different than it was a couple of years ago or let's say five years ago. Uh, multilateralism is weaker, actually it's less popular than before and the EU is the only big market which is seriously trying to keep multilateralism alive and also fix it. For instance, when looking at WTO, I think um, it's us who is most interested in uh, fixing it. Also, the security environment has changed. Russia has interfered to, to many uh, democratic processes of our member states, but not only Russia. There are also other actors who are involved in our, in our continent and in our demo democratic processes. Also, data and cy cyber security has raised new security questions. Economic tools are used differently than before for, so, so to say, hooking some countries. And, and for instance, subsidized investments are playing bigger role than before. And this may lead, if everything goes wrong, to the situation where open competition will shrink. And that is very bad from, from many perspectives. Also, the fundamental values are challenged from within the EU, but also from outside. Poland and Hungary are the most worrisome examples uh, of, of the countries which are challenging our fundamental values from within. And by the way, I, I find this as the biggest challenge for the European Union, uh, internal challenge for the European Union, because we are nothing if we cannot share of fundamental values. Also, China, as the European Commission defined it two years ago, is a strategic partner, but at the same time, systemic rival. 
this lack of reciprocity in, in trade and investment is becoming bigger problem within the EU. If somebody who wants to be our strategic partner uh, doesn't want to reciprocate the openness, it, raise, it raises doubts, it's suspicious. And this is becoming a bigger political issue within the EU and, and for good reasons. Um, social media gives opportunities to spread messages which challenge organized administration. But these are just a few examples of the political landscape, uh, which is now different than it was a uh, few years ago. So the question, the fundamental question is how can democratic rule of law uh, driven multilateral cooperation believer and open market survive in this kind of world? Is it possible? Um, and and, and of course, the EU is this kind of organization or entity. And if we are not ready to use hard power or military power against our independent neighbors, or if we are not poisoning people uh, abroad, so is there room for democ democratic rule of law based open society anymore? We tend to have. Uh, uh, the way to speak that the EU is weak. And in some sense, this is true if we use the indicator that whether somebody is ready to use military power against its independent neighbors. But does this mean that democracy is always weaker than those which are who are not democracies and are open to, to behave badly or use force against the others. I still believe that democracy will prevail. And I have four themes or topics which I find the most uh, crucial for reforming the EU to become stronger. Uh, first topic is climate change and biodiversity loss. The, this entity is a mega trend that will impact to everything what we do in Europe, but also globally. We need, uh, there's a need for systemic change to the economy, how it, how it functions, and we need modern type of market regulation in order to boost, for instance, circular economy uh, development. EU at the moment is the most advanced circular economy internal market in the world. And EU as a market regulator can be a forerunner for writing a new market order, which the others most probably will follow. So whole economic activity in the future will run around climate change and biodiversity loss type of problems. And there are needs for market based opportunities because everybody knows that we cannot address these two challenges by using only tax based money. So if you manage to create competitive, uh, uh, sustainable market, I think we are in the right side of the history, but also the most interesting market for the others. The second topic I want to raise is data economy. There is no country or market currently where the use of data would have been regulated democratically. And this is something new. Data uh, economy will be the second uh, strong driver in the world economy in coming years. Uh, so basically, we don't have a market which would be ethically, uh, which could be called as an ethically driven uh, data market. He was the only one who has started this work. GDPR legislation is the first attempt to. to to bring some order, ethical order, the data market, but it's, it's just um, the first touch to this uh, topic. Aim should be to create a sustainable data single market, which strengthen trust between consumers and business and business to business market. EU can set global standards 
and and third countries most probably will will follow them and especially if they want to operate in our market single market they must adapt to our uh, regulation why i raised these two topics first uh, climate change biodiversity loss and data economy is because they are the biggest economic drivers in the global market in in the years to come and we can be standard setters and and this will give uh, us the first mover advantage third area which i want to raise is defense security and foreign policy as the world has changed and as the security environment has changed it's a necessity for us to make us stronger also in terms of uh, security and defense you must be capable um, for the well-functioning cooperation in cybersecurity against hybrid threats and also in military issues. EU and NATO cooperation is deeper today than ever before. And we have to uh, work for deepening this relationship. But whoever is the president of the United States, we need to be capable to act with or without allies when it comes to, to security and defense. We also need single voice in foreign policy. We need majority decision making in foreign policy. Uh, now unanimity makes it uh, easy for one member states or third country to take whole EU as a hostage. We have some concrete cases which has proven this. We have enough experiences of external interference in elections, uh, decision deadlocks, third country pressure against member state, which has paralyzed EU decision making. So as the world has changed, we must be stronger also in terms of security. The final point is the stability and growth pact. And this is an area where we certainly need uh, some treaty changes in the future. Currently, stability and growth pact is a source of mistrust between member states. Due to lack of uh, national economic reforms, uh, vulnerable public finance because of indebtedness, continuous arguments and mistrust between member states, a lower than necessary growth potential and, and social inequality, there are good reasons to reform stability and growth pact. We all know that within the Eurozone, we have some countries which can be considered as too big to fail. And uh, and if they even cough, the rest of the uh, rest of the Eurozone uh, get flu. So we need a better uh, regulation, tougher regulation, but also more solidarity. Solidar solidarity versus responsibility is the is a long-standing um, source of mistrust between the member states. I understand both dimensions. Someone says that if years after years your country is doing worse than the other, how you can expect the others to finance your irresponsible lifestyle? This is reality at the moment, and this is the right way to look at it. But at the same time, we all are in the same boat and we must be capable to stabilize economy together. And if any of us gets in trouble, we must help each other. So I have um, three concrete proposals how to, or what should be explored more and what are potential um, points of, uh, of changes. First, we need control debt restructuring mechanism, meaning that uh, the government bond should include common action clauses in, in the case that um, that a country is uh, going towards bankrupt. This would strengthen market discipline. Second, we need uh, uh, we need to look at the opportunity to for limited euro bonds, for instance, up to 60% of GDP. Uh, above these member states would be on their own. And third, I'm interested in pre-funded unemployment insurance scheme, which would uh, uh, complement the national automatic stabilizers. So these three is a combination of tougher market discipline and better solidarity, which would uh, strengthen the Eurozone's 
um, uh, economic strength. I will finalize by saying that even though the world has changed and we are in the middle of biggest, the big, the big challenges, our opportunity is uh, the economic strength, creating new single market for new uh, economic megatrends such as uh, environment and data, and that we become stronger in terms of security and defense. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jyrki, so much. I think that would be a pretty good agenda for the, the, the conference on the, the future of the EU. I hope the future president is listening to us uh, today. But now I will give the floor to Hanna. Thank you. Uh, many thanks indeed for this uh, opportunity to uh, take part. Uh, I was very glad to listen to Jyrki Katainen and particularly appreciated his starting from uh, multilateralism, how multilateralism is weakening, uh, how it is less popular uh, and how it is perhaps only the EU that tries to fix it. And I would like to start from here. Uh, we need to be thinking of multilateralism as uh, uh, maintenance of multilateralism or management of multilateralism. But we also need to think about another similar question, and that is the maintenance and management of dependencies, of relations of dependency of different kinds. Now that the EU is looking for increased autonomy. Um, a couple of words about multilateralism first. Um, yes, we do doubt the continued viability of our multilateral institutions and organizations. Yes, it is the great powers that ignore the uh, institutions that hamper, undermine, discredit organizations. But also the uh, the bigger ones, the big, the great powers, also they need institutions for problem solving, and also one might add for some kind of a legitimate forms of control over the smaller ones. Uh, I think the real problem, one of the real problems here, is the misuse of multilateral institutions. They are used, but they are used for different purposes that they were created for. Um, I think um, the way human rights are approached now by UN human rights, uh, rights bodies is an example of this. So great powers from the inside change the institutions so that they actually serve new purposes uh, not agreed by everyone. Um, the EU, yes, is needed to counter this tendency, but um, is it able to? Can we count on it? Um, we used to say that the EU is a regulatory power by excellence and that it is also a force for good, but I think it really needs to show that it is a reliable partner and that there is a reason to count on it uh, on these matters. And I think the reason to count on the EU um, has to do with the very fact that it is different from the great powers. It can serve broader interests than them. It can function in a more inclusive and transparent way, and perhaps uh, also in a, more, in a way that is more respectful of divergences. Uh, diversity that it has also inside. So here is where we have a clash, in a sense. Uh, the EU would need to be this kind of a different actor, while at the same time it is clearly trying to work more to protect the interests of the Union and the interests of its citizens in, in order to gain more internal popularity. So we have attention. The second point I would like to make is also uh, a question of tension and management in a sense. And that is the question of dependencies or 
relations of dependence and interdependence. Um, dependence also can be positive and negative. If we think about cooperation, the value added of cooperation, um, it is complementarity. It is your ability to depend on another actor, uh, rely on another actor for something that you don't have. That's the positive side. But dependencies can also be negative. Uh, dependency can be a tool of power. It can be a tool of coercion. And I think we see more and more of this. Um, the EU, I think, is a very poor actor if it cannot depend on any other actor for anything. It needs reliable partners. And it also needs to be a reliable partner itself um, and letting others depend on it. Um, now, what, what is important here is that the goods or the assets uh, that we depend on are changing. If we go back uh, in history, um, the uh, European communities were founded on coal and steel. And now we want to get rid of them. We want to be carbon neutral and we want to have recycled steel. But dependencies exist. And now it is dependency on information, technology, knowledge. And it is here we need to start uh, managing dependencies, but not, not completely going against as, as requiring complete autonomy um, in this field. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Hanna. And now, Paul. I think your mic is not turned on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, I was starting by, by thanking the organizers. Uh, thank you very much to the uh, Finnish Institute for International Affairs, in particular, in particular to my friend Juha Jokela, for making this possible and um, a big thank you also of course to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland. I think uh, we cannot have enough of those of these uh, debates. Um, although I believe there are no substitute for meeting physically, I would, would have loved to be in Helsinki today and uh, I, I sent you all the best wishes uh, from sunny Vienna. Um, uh, to the issue as such, um, I, I would just uh, pick out some bits and pieces of what uh, Yipki and, and Hannah have just said and, and give my grain of thought uh, to this, because I find uh, that they raised very important and, and interesting points. Um, I, I agree with Hannah that um, uh, autonomy is not the, the only way, but how can we redefine our relationships with other global actors? I mean, we cannot do it on our own globalization might uh, look differently in the years to come, but it is here to stay. It is one of the elements of our well-being and of our welfare. We want to transform it uh, based on our uh, vision and ideas, but uh, we cannot decouple ourselves uh, from the rest of the world, although the world uh, might, might become a, a more difficult uh, place. But still, uh, we have to interact with everyone <clears throat> and maybe not as a referee, although values and rules are very important for us, but, uh, but as, as a global player. I think um, it has been emphasized by many before that economically, um, the European Union is a big player, while politically we're not there yet where we would like to be, but we're much better than we think we are. And uh, we tend to stress our weaknesses and maybe we have to work a little bit also on our self-esteem because I think uh, 
we, we are much stronger than, than we believe we are. And maybe this is also because we look very much to the inside. We have a lot of diversity, divergences, different voices, different views, different interests. So we try to um, discuss and, and, and solve our conflicts with our other neighbors within the European Union. And we sometimes forget to look to the outside and, and talk with one voice, which, which makes us strong. And, and then I, we are there um, at an issue which we talked about, uh, which you talked about before, the, the question of how to make sure that we actually can speak with one voice. Uh, what about the issue of unanimity and, and qualified majority voting? And then I agree, of course, with the Austrian ambassador that we have to look at the bigger picture because you cannot just take out big bits and pieces and, and change, change the voting system there. While I believe uh, it is legally possible and I believe in, uh, that on one or the other issue you can do it, um, the, the, the good thing with qualified majority is that you have a different dynamic in the discussions with each other and everyone has to argue and you don't, you cannot veto. But still, we strive to reach a consensus because we know that if we vote against each other, this is not the magic recipe. Uh, take, for example, the question of uh, distribution of refugees, where we had a, a Q&V vote. But in the end, um, it is not about the ways we vote. It is not about our tools. It is about our mindset. We, we talk a lot about new tools, but we don't talk a lot about changing our mindset. And, and uh, we have to find ways on how to improve our commitment and to improve our ownership. And in particular, in, in, in some of the EU capitals, we have to um, make sure that we live up to our European responsibility there. And to... And, um, <clears throat> Uh, Yuki talked about the mistrust uh, surrounding the uh, Stability and Growth Pact. And I would add that it is not only about the mistrust, but it's, it is many, many times about misunderstanding uh, each other because we still live in different national political spheres and um, we have to bridge that gap and we have to talk much more to each other in order to understand each other. And this is something which we cannot do uh, just... Um, uh, while meeting in, in a nice meeting room in Brussels, but you, you have to be out there um, and, and see each other physically and, and take the time to um, try to understand, put yourself in the other person's shoes, in the other country's shoes, and try to understand where the different uh, viewpoints come from and where you have common ground. I think that's important, not only to talk about new tools, but how to change uh, people's mindset and how to increase the commitment. Um, and I think um, uh, in the end of his uh, keynote, um, Girki stressed very much the economic side of uh, cooperation. And I think that is crucial now in the situation which we are at the moment, because um, it is all linked together. Of course, security is part of it <clears throat> and the whole global scenario uh, is, is part of it because the, the health crisis which we're in is not just restricted to the European Union, of course, but it is not only a health crisis, it is a big economic crisis. And I think we do not yet grasp the, the, the quality of, of, of recession which we are in and the implications that this may have. And even if we don't have the competences at European level, if we have the willingness to cooperate, we can still change things without talking about a change of treaties. A change of treaty uh, in the medium term is important, can be started, but this is not the magic recipe uh, to, to solve the problems at hand, I would say. So one of the big things which we will be confronted with in the near future is the social dimension and the inequality within the European Union. This gap and this division will be much stronger. I believe that the, the decisions taken in July regarding the MFF and the, the next generation EU package of financial aid is very, very important. Talk to our friends and neighbors in the south of Europe and to other countries who are strongly affected um, by the health crisis. And there's almost none which is not at the moment. And you will see how important that is. The, the problem is We've taken that decision, but we have to move from words to action. 
mean, we, we, we have to get this thing on the ground implemented. And, and there we have the, the long institutional path of getting, getting things done, which, um, which, uh, which uh, challenges our strategic patience, I would say. And that is a big issue. We have to get the things on the ground and we have to make sure that we actually help people um, and, it, and Yiki said, we're all in this boat together. That's, that's very, very true. I mean, uh, it is not just about uh, uh, organizing grants or loans, but it is about our own, it's not about only showing solidarity, but it is in our own interest to help each other because we're very dependent on each other. And that's a good thing. And I think um, with that, the discussion can start. Well, wow, thank you, Paul, and thank you, everybody, for your your thoughts. There would be so many things I would like to touch upon, but I will give the floor to Jyrki to react on uh, on Hannas and Paul's uh, comments, if you want to give some immediate reactions. Now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hannah and Paul, for your for your uh, interesting thoughts. I just would like to. Um, collect some of your thoughts and put them around the concept of strategic autonomy. Because uh, you touch upon this topic also. So um, when I first time heard uh, President Macron to launch this, um, this, uh, uh, this concept, I immediately thought that this is the beginning of, uh, of um, protectionism. But when I listened to him a bit more, and when I thought myself, I found it quite meaningful concept, but it 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 deserves a definition. So um, for me, strategic autonomy means that we are not subordinated. So we are independent, not uh, too dependent, but independent for cooperating with others. So, and, and today I find two or three major areas where we have to look at very carefully not to become subordinated. The first one is technology. So uh, I'm not technology uh, professional, but I just wonder if there is any particular technology which is so crucial that if we by accident uh, pine ourselves to technology which we cannot get rid of later, and if this technology is used against us or against free market or against free competition, then we are in trouble. So, and, and, and the second point is economic uh, dependence. So, what I try to say is that, that we should be economically um, so independent that we are not too dependent, even though we are promoting multilateral uh, interconnected world. But we should never end up being subordinated. And the second point, which I raised all, all already before, is the security link. So hopefully we could secure our security and safety together with allies. But if this is not possible, we have to do it by ourselves. So, so the, uh, what I try to say is that strategic autonomy is a relevant concept, but it cannot lead to, to lack, of, uh, lack of competition or the subsidized uh, business. Um, the worst thing I could imagine is that we start subsidizing our own business and it would lead or we would participate to the global subsidy competition. And I can tell you already now that we will lose this game. Some of our strategic partners are always or they have always deeper pockets than we have. So, so number one uh, priority in the multilateralism should be to avoid global competition and subsidies. Of course, there may, there may be some technologies, for instance, batteries or something, something else where we need European European, a strong European business base, but, um, but um, 
but uh, by and large, the subsidy policy is not the way to defend our independence. Thank you, Jyrki. I think this was a sort of great bridge to, to the um, theme of uh, strategic uh, autonomy that's on everybody's lips at this moment. And I mean, the Commission has been labelled as geopolitical, which uh, for me was a great thing. I think the, the more accurate term would be geoeconomic. We would like that kind of term maybe more in, in Finland, and that's maybe at the core of what uh, the Commission is doing. And uh, the, the European uh, Council President has said the European strategic autonomy is the goal number one for our generation. Autonomy is not protectionism, it is the the opposite. And I mean, for countries like us, I mean, Finland and Austria and Sweden as well, this is a bit, and I think Jyrki took up some really good concrete things about how we might change our traditional liberal thinking on these issues like trade policy and competition policy and so on. But this is pretty much, and of course, we have this allergy to the French uh, traditional thinking, and we think that uh, the Corona and China only used as pretexts for pushing the, the traditional French agenda and so on. So for us, it's a bit like uh, squaring the circle and also being realistic. We should not be clinging to the past if the world is changing too much. But I mean, this, this debate is really, really uh, difficult. You raised technology, economic dependence, security. Those are, um, I think, also really good places to start but i mean do you do you uh, other do, hannah and paul do you have some other concrete terms where we should in the eu change our thinking on uh, on the strategic autonomy and should we have a different trade pol policy stance how do you view for example uh, the 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 carbon border levy that is being discussed i mean that was uh, for countries like Finland, it was always labeled as a protectionist measure that goes against the WTO rules, and we don't want to undermine. Uh, I mean, what's our what's what's our leeway in these questions? Do you have some, or should we promote uh, things like European champions? If Nokia and Ericsson want to get together to build uh, something on the moon or whatever, mm -hmm. should we be more open? Uh, open in these questions. Uh, I mean, are we just, uh, are we prisoners in Finland uh, in the traditional orthodox liberal uh, jargon? I see some opening in Jyrki's thinking for changing uh, these, uh, these things in Finland as well. But would you like to add something to this debate? Uh, and how should this be done? Should we do it multilaterally in global institutions, or should we go on our own on digi digital taxation also? And I mean, there are a huge number of concrete issues that we could do or should not do, but uh, any concrete ideas on this theme would be more than welcome. <laughs> Paul, for example, you can start. Yes. <laughs> okay. I have okay. task of asking questions well, and you have the difficult task of uh, answering them. Well, I can answer them by asking questions myself because I have a lot of them too. Anyway, uh, I think um, protectionism has quite a, a negative uh, connotation, but I believe um, uh, to a certain extent there are areas where uh, the single market needs to be protected. I think uh, there are critical strategical industries. Uh, we need to make sure that there's uh, food security, that there, that we have a secure supply of, of, uh, of medical equipment. Uh, we have our strategic interest in technical investments, in research and development. Um, you've mentioned the promotion of European champions. I think that's also a strategic necessity. Uh, I believe um, it, uh, it, it makes sense to think strategically about how to organize the European single market and uh, to make sure and avoid that there's no crowding out of European know-how expertise. Uh, I think that that's part of the, of the discussion of strategic uh, autonomy, but also of, of discussion on, on uh, dependencies. 
uh, but that's the look, uh, it, that's the view uh, towards the inside of, of the European single market. On the other hand, uh, I, I believe personally that uh, this is now the time for, uh, for new trade agreements um, because uh, these are also tools where we can try to define and set uh, European standards, which then um, are uh, understood, applied and discussed uh, by others. And I think that that is an important moment um, for us uh, to move, move on here. Um, the, if you think about data protection, for example, that's an example where uh, the European Union was quite successful. And um, uh, with the Green Deal in mind, I'm not really, I'm in favor of an open discussion regarding the, the carbon border levy, which you've mentioned, and also the question of digi digital taxation, because um, that is indeed on very different levels, a very important challenge uh, for the European Union um, when it comes to tax taxation, when it comes to know-how, when it comes to um, the question of, of uh, tackling climate change. Now, these are issues where we, uh, yes, I agree, these are issues which in the end can only be solved by global cooperation, but uh, the European Union needs to have a strong stance on this. Again, not as a referee, but as a real player with vested interests. I think that's important. And let everyone know that, that we are a player there. And uh, the single market is a, one of the biggest uh, economic markets in the world. And we should use that leverage uh, to change one of the other elements of, of the system. Thank you. Can I here? Yeah, uh, I'd like to add something on the uh, connection between uh, economy and uh, security here. Uh, because also when looking at uh, strategic autonomy from the point of view of security and defense, obviously uh, there is a link to economy, to, for instance, the EU's own revenues, the size of the EU's budget, uh, the ways in which the EU's budget can be used. And all this needs perhaps a re, uh, rethinking as well. Um, uh, Jürgen defined strategic autonomy uh, as being in, independent or uh, able to act uh, independently and in cooperation. And I think this is also very fitting for the realm of security. Uh, and it is also possible, but clearly we need then capabilities, uh, also the financial means, and uh, improved decision-making capacity. And I think here is a, a crucial difference between uh, the internal markets and the uh, security and defense policy. Uh, because in security and defense, the EU also needs, in a sense, to be independent of its own member states. There is this kind of debate going on all the time. And the, uh, the problem of decision-making is much more uh, thorny in this field. And we already mentioned the uh, qualified majority voting, how much some people see it as really needed now in order to be able to advance, but others see many problems in it and, and uh, highlight the need instead for unanimity as a kind of uh, a fundament for legitimacy. Um, so uh, there is no easy way out, but uh, decision-making is in the, uh, in the field of security even more complicated than it is in the economic field. Thank you. The, uh, that was a good, really good point between the economic and the, the security sphere. And we have been touching upon the decision making structure in the, in, the, in the EU a lot. And I mean, we have a lot of problems caused by the uh, 
the Hungarians and the Polish, to, to be blunt. And uh, it, it's kind of a systematic uh, approach to, to, to undermine some core values in, in the EU, as, uh, as Jyrki said in the opening remarks. Maybe just very briefly on the decision making. I think uh, Maximilian Hennig made a great point about looking at the decision making structures and QMV, uh, the qualified majority uh, voting in, in, in uh, foreign and security policy. That we just cannot have this debate on a case by case basis as we have been trying to do by the Commission very bravely, but it looks very not very good to be to be honest. Do you think that um, it would be realistic if we have the conference uh, on the future of Europe uh, in in the state of the Union that we are in, with the the people running respective countries in uh, in Eastern Europe? Do you think that would be uh, a realistic possibility that we should explore? to try to make the EU stronger, or is it just counterproductive at, uh, at this point? Uh, this, this doesn't have to be a long discussion, but I mean, what's your basic feeling? Uh, is there really leeway for trying to make the EU stronger by, by reverting more to the uh, qualified majority voting or looking at the decision making structures in, in general? Well, um, if I may um i think this 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 is not a major problem i i think everybody agrees that we should be stronger in foreign policy and qualified majority voting especially on foreign policy related issues supposed not to be the major obstacle this is how i feel but i i can be can be wrong too but but, but, but then if, if we talk about the other more delicate issues like um, rule of law mechanisms, there it's more difficult to get um, qualified majority voting. Hopefully we get, but, but um, I don't see the same similar linkage in in foreign policy issues. If also looking at the track record, the foreign ministers in the council mostly shares the views on most of the foreign policy issues. Sometimes it takes time to to find a common ground, but by the by and large, they have managed to, to in most of the cases, they have managed to to find a common ground. So in that sense, um, I I think it's uh, it's possible to to change this this bit. Now, if if I may add something here, I would say that um, I think the the important. Uh, issue at the moment is to do politics which are focused on results. And I, I was very positively surprised by the, uh, the result of the uh, EU summit on the financial, Corona financial aid and the MFF in, in July after five, five days of a marathon summit. And uh, maybe we can just repeat the exercise. <laughs> Uh, get heads of states and government together, uh, lock them up in the room until uh, white smoke comes out of the roof and, and have the uh, asylum and migration package uh, uh, in the end um, decided. And, and uh, I think uh, we need to talk much more to each other. Uh, we need a change of mindset. Uh, and uh, there, the mind, if you just change the rules and move from unanimity to QMV, the dynamics are different. But if a country says, no, this is in my national interest and I don't want this to change, it won't change. We need to reach consensus. In order to reach consensus, we need to talk much more. Use more leverage. I don't know. Um, use every, every, every possibility you have at hand to convince the others. Um, but uh, we're all in this together. And, and um, the European Union is a big patchwork family. And the more members we have, the more difficult it gets. But uh, everyone knows what, uh, what, what, what they want. And um, I think um, discuss the things and negotiate until uh, no one wants to negotiate anymore and then reach a consensus. But we have to speed up the whole process. Because if we talk about asylum and migration, we've been uh, driving in a roundabout or uh, going, to, going against the wall for the last five years. I mean, this is, 
this is something that, that, that the proposals are on the table and we need to solve this. We cannot solve uh, it together, the, the 27. Well, then go for enhanced cooperation, look for other ways. I don't know. I mean, my preference would be if everyone would stick together, but I think we have to speed up the decision making. I think that that is what is expected. I know that's difficult because of the complexity of interest and the complexity of the issues, but uh, that's 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 where the frustration comes from, and that's where we need to improve. So more works for the heads of states. Uh, it's not an easy job in Europe. Hanna. Yeah, uh, I'd like to continue. Uh, from here, I fully agree that, yes, uh, more discussion, getting to know uh, each other better, as banal as it may sound, is fundamentally important, and it also is the way to mutual trust. But still, how to, um, how to manage the uh, going from unanimity to qualified majority voting, that is a bit of a mystery, and I think we we may have to use these piecemeal ways out, uh, um, fixing little by little, because uh, uh, fundamental treaty change is not really what is um, uh, for foreseeable <laughs> uh, in the future. Um, but having said that, I also think that the EU, yes, it does also need a treaty change at some point. And um, I, would, I would hope, I don't know how you would react to this, but I would hope uh, when thinking about an eventual treaty change, uh, above all uh, for a change towards something more simple, uh, towards a, a kind of constitution-like treaty uh, that is much shorter and simpler uh, and uh, letting many other things uh, be regulated on a different level and in different kinds of treaties so that there is not only one huge big treaty that has to be opened uh, uh, and exposed for all kinds of discussions if you want to make a small uh, amendment um, but i don't know whether that is a way out European constitution, we need it. We have tried it, we need it even more than before. I mean, the time is soon running out, but I would just like to two questions with very short answers. One, um, Yurki opened the door a little bit for something we might call the fiscal union. I mean, to have some common debt, to have some unemployment uh, insurance schemes. This is getting, I mean, an acute question because the corona crisis is really hitting us, uh, as Paul said. Should we uh, in, in Finland and Austria be open to this kind of uh, development? In uh, Even Christine Lagarde said that uh, she would be ready to some kind of permanent structures. Should we do this? Should we be open to this? And second thing, very shortly, is the EU doing enough on climate and biodiversity? Jurgi can start. Yeah, okay, so um, I already said what I thought uh, about the stability and growth pact. Um, you mentioned the solidarity aspects, but we also need more or better market discipline because, for instance, the, uh, if looking at the Italy's bond price, they are not, according to my understanding, they are, they are not market priced or market does not give Italian bond a price, and this is not uh, healthy. So we need better market discipline and, for instance, common action clauses to public uh, bonds and debt restructuring mechanism is needed. And at the same time, we, we need some um, solidarity aspects. But uh, this particular issue, stability growth pact, is the one where leaders need to sit down and talk more and learn from their own beliefs. This is very important what Paul mentioned in the other other occasion. But um, but but I, I believe that mistrust can be solved if leaders just had time to sit down in officially and and compare their thoughts and ideologies. Uh, 
finally, uh, EU is doing marvelous job in 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 this green area. Green uh, deal is the biggest economic driver in the world at the moment. So I I believe that this is uh, this is the beginning of, of um, the start of the new beginning. So so I I hope that we could manage to use our regulatory tool for creating new business opportunities, new single market, new standards for, for sustainable products and, and markets. Great. Paul. Yes. Now, I, I, I just want to stress that I think, um, I mean, with the uh, recovery fund now, we have almost doubled the EU financial capacities. Uh, so this, this is quite historical, I would say, and we, we, we still need to implement this and see how it works. And, and uh, depending on how it works and how uh, the whole recession advances regarding the, the corona crisis, uh, we will have more or less uh, leeway to, to move uh, to, to permanent tools or to different tools. Um, I think from, from an official Austrian perspective, uh, this is not, not very popular at the moment. But I would, um, I would be in favor of, of discussing the bigger economic and financial picture as we move deep, deeper into an economic crisis. Uh, on the Green Deal, I, I think um, there is um, there, there is a lot of things moving on on the European level, but it, also here it needs it needs commitment, it needs engagement, and it needs implementation. Uh, in particular, because of the diverse and different situations between the member states and their economic stages of development, I think we have to make sure that we, we are able to support those who are lacking behind here and also to, to set standards on a global level. Thank you. Also, there a mix of, of uh, responsibility and solidarity. And then, very quickly, Hanna, and then I will give the floor to Mika Aldola, the director of FIA, to close this great uh, event. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, the climate and biodiversity. Yes, uh, the EU is doing great things and innovating. It might need a stronger voice in the very Hamburg by the sometimes the different EU organs speaking differently and uh, competing with each other. And uh, of course, it's not enough. The, uh, the problems are, are huge. And perhaps we also need to rethink uh, our economic thinking a bit. Uh, again, a kind of long-term uh, goal. Perhaps, for instance, in a way of uh, trying to diminish the distance between our economic thinking and our thinking about the uh, protection of the environment to make them more like uh, one. Uh, that might be a way ahead. Thank you, Hanna, so much. And thank you all. I mean, it was a really great debate. I learned a lot myself. Uh, this was a great use of time. And now, Mika, I'm sorry we ate into your time, but Please. No, uh, well, I have I have been enjoying. I hope uh, you can hear me. Um, I have been enjoying the, the conversation very much. So I, I feel that you have more to add to the debate than than I do. It has been a great great couple of hours, and and uh, uh, if it goes a couple of minutes to extra time, I I don't mind. Although my dogs might mind because they want to go out. <laughs> So the stars are usually very well aligned for European Union, and the class is always uh, half full. Uh, the emergencies are opportunities, uh, and we all know this aspirational and motivational starting point that that uh, many of the policy-relevant European Union discussions have. You know, uh, fighting Corona leads to uh, new funding packets. This is used to create a bundle of good things. Uh, for strategic autonomy and for fighting climate change. Uh, things go smoothly, even though the world is a very rough place currently. And I'm very happy that that, that that event today was based on reality and actual challenges uh, that are not solvable uh, through rhetoric acts of, of, of good faith or bundles of, of uh, all good things. One has to be more incremental and more pragmatic, realistic, 
especially as Hanna pointed out, uh, fundamental treaty changes are impossible. And we all know that there's reasons for that. I'm happy that the discussions today uh, have been uh, pragmatic uh, and realistic. Uh, I also appreciate uh, Jurgi Katainen's uh, point about the Ital Italy's bond prices, a fundamental insight into, into the situation currently, uh, kind of the new normal or distorted uh, normal. When uh, Finland and Austria and Sweden became the 13th, 14th and 15th member state of the union, referendums were part of the membership process. Democratic consultation has given membership additional legitimacy uh, and has made membership a function of political accountability. The support of membership is very high. For example, in Finland, uh, there's uh, only 13% of people who are opposing the membership currently. However, key aspects of democracy, such as accountability and transparency, are key to sustaining this sense of legitimacy. Studies have shown that membership has produced uh, economic welfare in Sweden, Finland and Austria. Uh, uh, citizens have benefited from the membership uh, greatly, especially in Austria, where the later Eastern enlargement produced uh, quite a lot of economic well-being. The countries are also net contributors to the community uh, budget. And they usually have supported a version of solidarity that highlights example, keeping of, of, uh, of good faith, keeping of best practices and of following rules. That is the way these countries have seen what solidarity means, kind of a teaching uh, to others through good examples. It hasn't meant uh, solidarity in terms of, of compassion uh, and granting economic support to other member states. And this has, of course, been changing uh, lately, and it has ramifications when it comes to the membership status of, of, of these countries and, and how their membership contributes to the overall cohesion and dynamism of the union. Uh, I want to also note that uh, all the three countries are non-NATO member states. Uh, and that, uh, with that, they have brought their own historical experiences to the, to the Union. And it's uh, drafting of common foreign uh, defense and security policies. For example, for Finland, uh, Russia policy is extremely important. Uh, Finland has been acting on a bilateral basis to, uh, with, with Russia. However, the European Union has offered useful functionality when it comes to uh, externalizing some of the aspects of, of high politics uh, to the Union. So it has acted as a buffer for Finland. Finland has gained quite a lot. And this has been a uh, win-win situation. And this is my final remark. Uh, different countries have learned how to use different functionalities of the union to what they benefit from economic security and this has led to a win-win situation where these very solid uh, democracies have been able to contribute to the cohesion of the common big projects of the union like the enlargement pro uh, projects and i hope that this situation will be sustained also in the, future, uh, in the future, where new types of emergencies might not be so much of opportunities that, that uh, we would hope them to be. Um, so I, I would like to thank all the participants, the panelists, the keynote speakers. It has been uh, greatly insightful two hours, and I hope we will return to this topic in these three countries in 25 years as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.